Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's episode four of the Justin Bell Show, so subtly and modestly named. Uh, because it is such an, a milestone to reach four shows, uh, not really for normal people, I, I promised one of my oldest mates that he could get on the show and be the first person. But I didn't live up to that, Jill. Jill DeFerrin, everybody, who, uh, I mean, he's, he's an epic icon, a legend uh, to, to nearly everyone involved in racing. But for me, he is one of my best mates, and I'm not in LA anymore, as you can see. I'm, I'm you outside. Doing? I'm good. I've been running around. Uh, Gilles lives in Fort Lauderdale, and I thought it would be a rather nice treat to come by and ask him to be on the show on my way to Daytona for the Rolex this weekend. It was also an excuse to be able to stay at his house, and his house, as you can look out there, is rather magnificent, and uh, he said yes. So, well, here we are, Gilles. How old. are you? I'm good. How are you? Long time no see. It has actually been a long time no see. We talk we, a lot, but we don't see we each talk other a lot. that much. We do, oh, Jim Watson says, tell him I say hi. That should be, yes. Thank you, Jim. Do you know what? This should be entertaining, Paige. Well, I, I, you could be right. It could be entertaining. Because you see, maybe Jill and I, <laughs> there, there are things we know about each other that we can only reveal when one of us dies. <laughs> Have you thought about that? Yeah. No, I've never thought no, about you, that. Yeah. He, do you know what? He's, he's, trying to, he's trying to sabotage now. But it's okay because we got given the famous Brazilian drink. Sure. Mexican, before. actually. Is this me? What, are we just having a margarita? Yeah, just a margarita. Okay. Yeah. It's also the first episode where I've had a drink. But that is fine. So, Jill, I thought... You like it? I do like it. It's got a nice edge. Yeah, yeah. That's the trouble with our relationship. It so has so often uh, ended with cocktails. But... I was thinking, mate. It usually starts with cocktails. It starts with cocktails and then the evening just gets better. <laughs> and it ends with more cocktails. It does. So, listen, what I was thinking was, um, yeah. as I was, you know, I even Wikipedia'd you. You did? Mm -hmm. That's not a very good page, actually. No, it's actually uh, not a very good page because it doesn't no. tell a story. And what I've realized about doing my show is that everybody has stories that I haven't actually got around to asking. Yeah. It doesn't matter how long you know someone. Yeah. I bet there's a lot true. about me you don't know. Maybe. Maybe there's a few things. Um, <laughs> so, oh, he, Jill, who remembers you from the Formula 3 Championship in the 1990s? Well, John, you're obviously old as well. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about that racing while well, you're on the subject of going back. I was realizing it's like any of the successful people you meet. There's a... Let me lean forward. Yeah, there's a, yeah. there's a... So we look a little more... There, where we are. There's a disconnect between how they started... And when they got to the top, because we never really hear about the ones that don't succeed. You know, if, yeah. if you had, if you'd not got out of a go kart, we wouldn't probably know each other. And you don't hear the stories. And you don't hear the stories. Races and you don't hear the stories about their own races. All went wrong. We also only meet the guys. Oh, that guy sold his internet company for five hundred million. Yeah. We don't. We don't meet the thousand, hundred thousand guys that went yeah. broke doing yeah. it. So I was thinking, you know, there you are. You're in Brazil. Um, oh, he's Brazilian, in case anyone doesn't know. Um, you're in Brazil, even though I know you didn't come from the uh, the impoverished area of Brazil, yeah. getting out of Brazil and making your name in professional racing, this is why I'm just going to start with this, must have seemed almost an impossible impossible dream when you were little. Yeah, I mean, listen, it was, it was um, uh, let me see where I, what I'm going to start. Uh, let me start. When was that moment? Yeah, start from yeah, the beginning. Start, start from my background. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I come from a you know uh, a middle class family. You know, my, my dad was an engineer. Uh, well, he is an engineer still alive, and you know, my uncle was a doctor. And so my, quite smart people. Well, my grandfather was a doctor. The other one was an economist, and the other one was an engineer as well, and and a geologist and a computer scientist and all this. So. I guess um, the, the the culture in my family was, uh, you know, academics. Yeah, academics. You go to school, you know, and and you get a, a degree, and and you, you get a real job. You get a real job, <laughs> and you <laughs> contribute to society, and and a, and a career in sports, as as unbelievable as that yeah. that may sound, it really wasn't, um, you know. Part of our it wasn't, culture. It wasn't a culture. It, no, it no, was, no, no, it no, was no, not no. part of our culture, you know. Uh, and and particularly here in the U.S., you know, is 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 kind of hard for people, I think, to get yeah. that. You know, yeah. it's like yeah. okay, well, you can go play, uh, do, do do the fun stuff, and then then you yeah get serious and, and get a job. And quite frankly, um, I 
was okay with that. You yeah. know, I yeah. mean, I, I like my, my, my studies. Uh, I was studying to become an engineer. Um, so the family at that point I, 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 couldn't I'm see just, any red flags. And to be fair, my mom and dad were not against me racing either, okay. you know? So it was one of those that I didn't really seriously consider a career in racing, you know, um, out of my own accord, yeah. even though I loved the thing. I was like glued, I yeah. love cars. So at home, we didn't really talk about football, politics or anything like that. It was just racing cars, cars and obviously engines and tires. There were some pretty driving. big heroes at that time. Wasn't yeah, it? no, absolutely. And, and that was, the, you know, my dad's background, you know, okay. he, was, he was a car guy. So, you know, I remember sitting there as a, as a kid learning how to, you know, in, in his car in the garage, you know, learning how to do heel and toe, which is, you know. A lost some, art yeah, right lost now. Art, yeah, no, so I'd sit there <laughs> and go like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and try to get coordinated yeah. and this kind of thing. I learned how to drive when I was, whatever, 11 years old. Um, and, uh, and every time I miss a downshift, you know, uh, my dad would make me stop okay. and start again, wow. <laughs> you know, yeah. until, I, until I got it right. Um, but anyway, so the whole, you know, car automobile culture was yeah. very much uh, part of our family also, you know. Um, and I started racing together uh, with with uh, my schooling. I wanted to race when I was nine I think nine was the first time I was like started bugging my mom and my dad to go racing. Yeah, and quite frankly, I don't think they had the means then, you know. Uh, but my dad's career went well. He used to work for Ford Motor Company, um, and uh, when I was fourteen, he said, "Look, uh, I was trying to get into a very difficult school in, in Sao yeah. Paulo, and he said, look, if you pass the uh, uh, when I say my dad, my mom and my dad, yeah. you know, if you pass.'" you know, this entrance exam, you know, yeah. um, and you get into that school, we'll buy you a new go-kart. <laughs> and and, uh, and we started racing. Wow. And uh, so I did. <laughs> and uh, we started racing and it's nice, you know, the team was uh, my dad, you know, my mom, a friend of mine, and, and yeah. myself. And, uh, kind you know, of my, simple times. Yeah, really. it it's was easy, great. Yeah. You know, my dad, but I learned a lot during that yeah. time, Justin, because my dad used to write job lists, you know, engineer, yeah. right? Yeah. Job lists. And then every time the go kart run, we used to take the whole thing apart and put it back together again in my house, you know. And I, you know, I learned, I, was, I love mechanic yeah. as well. Um, wow. And that was, you know, it actually but, but, was tra character traits that carried you through your whole career. Yeah, Who'd have known it? To, to some extent. Yeah. yeah, you know, so my training uh, started early. But honestly, at that time, I wasn't really thinking, okay, I'm going to make it a Formula One yeah. and, and, and all that kind of thing. It was just, you know, in my first year, I finished uh, third in the, in the state championship. Then the second year, I won, you know, and then I'm like, oh. Well, maybe I'm not that bad. <laughs> and, and do, you, do you remember? Because I remember the first motorbike, motocross race I won. The, it was a, it's a pivotal moment when you taste winning. Yeah. Suddenly you go. No, there's exactly. no excuses. No, and, and, and then it, it it started to get more and more serious. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, um, and then when I was 17, I started racing Formula Fours in Brazil. Yeah. Um, so I only did three years of karting. Um, Which is short in Brazil. Very, well, yeah, most, compared to most, most kids, people, most, most kids. kids start like eight, nine, yeah, seven. Yeah. You know, I started at fourteen. I did three years. I started doing cars. The first year was a disaster. You know, um, oh, yeah. I was seventeen. Seventeen. Wow. I had to get a special permission because at the time you couldn't race uh, cars until you had a license, and in Brazil you only get a license at eighteen. Okay. So I had to had a special permission, and that was the first few years that they allowed. You had to race cars before you were 18. And then uh, in the middle of the second year, actually, uh, I was already in university. Um, I nearly stopped, you know. I wow. mean, it was going that badly. <laughs> and um, uh, so, you know, I remember coming back home, actually, you know, after a disastrous race in, uh, in Brasilia. 
you know, we had a, like a family dinner. Yeah. Um, we had some sponsors, um, and we're like, you know what? Let's sell the car. You know, let's give the money back to the sponsors. Yeah. You know, and uh, because you know, there's no point. What's yeah. the point of spending money and it's just and, gonna you know, go nowhere and gonna go yeah. nowhere and run around in the back and all that kind of, that kind of thing right so uh, interestingly enough doing that that's a good well i think it's a cool story yeah. but um the um and I, I mean i would struggle to get in the top 10 top six and there's like lots yeah. of cars 40 yeah. cars and things like that um and uh we were running the second year we started running the car at home and it was just too complicated like we yeah. did the go kart but it was too much they're, yeah. they're too complicated yeah. and i didn't have enough experience it was a disaster basically so um i i, I remember um taking a, a water pump belt yeah you know yeah. i borrowed one from a professional team that had the, had had all, the equipment had and, gear gear and, and all this money. and i'm and i went to take it back you know um so we, he was based in sao paulo as well so i bought a new a new water pump belt i went to take it back and i got there and i went to lunch with a guy uh his name is giganti i think hey, giganti. Giganti. i was yeah. about to yeah. ask yeah his name is giganti and uh and he said what are you doing i said look i'm gonna stop you know yeah stop this. why would you stop yeah, exactly <laughs> man i've seen you i mean i think your potential I said, yeah, but you know, I mean, we don't have a lot of money and the results are ridiculous and, you know, it's no good. And um, I'm just going to focus on becoming a good engineer. And then he said, look, we have a place here, you know, he offered me a deal, you know. Wow. He must and, have seen something, and, but he'd seen a lot of drivers, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and well, I mean, he he was doing Super V with Nelson okay. BK wow. and all these guys. So he's he, he was been yeah. around for a long time. <laughs> so, cut a long story short, you know. Um, Are you sure about that? No, uh, <laughs> we don't quite have enough money actually, but you know, um, uh, we we ended up doing a deal, yeah. you know. Uh, and I won my third race with him, and then from the, and then I won the championship the next year, and then I seriously started considering a career outside, outside. of Brazil, and and really said, no, I can do this, you know. I, what I, a moment! I, yeah, it was so close. Was very you could have you could have been wearing like <laughs> you could have been wearing like the blue uniform of yeah, an engineer yeah, and a pencil. Go, <laughs> what are doing? Yeah. I'm actually just going to quickly bring this up. This look at this. The, here is a. Um, this chap, Rene, is actually yeah. screaming at me to bring this up because what? Bring what? I'll bring up this little video here. Rene, you'll know what this means, Jill. Oh, Salvatore's saying this. Salvatore, oh. 241.429. <laughs> yeah. Miles was, an hour. That was many years after the whole thing. <laughs> that was many years. <laughs> Jumping ahead, Salvatore, but we'll get to that story in a minute because how long after that was it that you were so, wearing this helmet? uh let me think so this was uh 95. wow uh and i'm talking about uh 85 86 87 so uh 10 years 10 years a little less than 10 years um, wild really yeah. isn't it actually it, from when i started racing cars to when i got into indy cars was actually 10 years that's incredible that's a long time actually well it? nowadays it is yeah basically and now the way it works for some of these young Formula yeah. One drivers, it's like puberty, yeah, no. maybe O levels, <laughs> go karting, <laughs> first date, Formula One. Yeah. I mean, what? It's, it's, Do you think they're ready? Yeah. I know we're going off well, on a tangent. I, I think some guys are and some guys are not. Is you it know? the head more than the, uh, the hands? I, I think training, you know, I think you, you, I see that today. A lot of the kids get very, very serious and intensive training um, from day one you know and uh and my journey was completely different you know it was a journey of discovery you know uh, i mean we were just well yeah but you know yeah. finding out i i tried to absorb as much as i could yeah. from whoever i could but i never had quite a professional training you know but i, I actually think even me with a dad who did it mm -hmm. It wasn't, you still didn't get into it going, that's my career. You know, yeah. you still get into it and wander around. Now, I don't think any of these kids, 
their, their, their parents believe they're going to be in Formula One or IndyCar the minute they're doing a first car race. Yeah. I think it's a <laughs> slightly different expectation. Yeah. Um, hey, listen, well, I'm, I was thinking about this when I was, when I was coming down here. Yeah. I know DC, DC's helmet is pretty obvious, yeah. right? It's yeah. got, the, it's got the, the, the Scottish yeah. flag on. My helmet's obvious. Bent Button's helmet's obvious. Most yeah. people's helmets are yeah. obvious. And Gilles' helmet design, um, we brought two down. Um, yeah. I have no clue where it came from. Well, it was in here. Um, that's actually that's the shall I put it here? Yeah, uh, right here. that's the um, the original uh, here. Yeah. He's going to torture you a minute while I find the lights yeah. in his house because they're oh, just yeah. on down. It's on the left. Yeah. Uh, is it on? No. Yeah. There you go. And more. There you go. So this is the um, you back. Yeah. This is actually the original colors, Justin. Okay. Um, yeah. Can you see? Yeah. Look. We can see, right? Yes, perfect. Uh, that's the original colors, and it was. I did it, uh, and you can see it's got a little bit of a, like a sort of oblique, sort yes, of, sort of thing. And um, I did it because actually, um, I did it when I was fifteen years old. You know, because it was the shape that tape would make. No, no, <laughs> um, no. Actually, I, I really liked Nicky Lauda at the ah. time. So I like, you know, he had the louder air sort of. Yeah. Uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, the L, uh, the L uh, thing. And, um, and I, I also kind of like this oblique contrasting lines yeah. instead of just a flowing line. Yeah. You know, because most helmet designs just are like. Go from front to back. Yeah. They yeah. go from front to back. And I, I wanted to do something. A little bit more. A little, um, how do you say? Uh, conflicting yeah. with uh, the direction of travel. Um, so you had absolutely no problem when your first IndyCar drive, they said, you're going to have to change your colors. You well, were like, uh, no. No, no. <laughs> Actually, that was a funny conversation. It was a, a, a gentleman that it was the, he was the head of uh, Penzoi at the time. Yeah. And who um, was an incredible guy, a great supporter. But then, then you know, I signed the deal. Uh, Jim Hall took me there to uh, to meet them, and it was it was very nice. And then I said, "Look, um, I would like to keep my helmet colors because it's it's it's, it's, my thing. it's like me, yeah. you know. I mean, I don't want to keep changing my helmet. It's like I used this helmet ever since I was a kid, uh -huh. you know." He said, um, "Well, how much do you want to be an indie car <laughs> kid?" <laughs> he said, "No, the helmet has to be yellow." I went, Okay, oh, yeah. <laughs> and then well, actually we reached a nice compromise, which you know it looks honest, really good. Uh, to be honest, the yellow, black, and red it, it turned out to work just as well. It was yeah. at least you didn't have to turn it into an orange helmet for Roger. Yeah, well, right. actually, then uh, then uh, we used the Philip Morris uh, uh, colors, yeah, uh, which are different than that. So then I changed the blue to black. Um, and that was the helmet yeah. I wore during the past few years. You know what's quite funny about, uh, well, I think interesting about driver. Oh, it is, isn't it? Driver's helmets is when you first design, for the most part, your driver's helmet. It's so not a corporate. It's it's a kid at fifteen years old designing yeah. his helmet. Yeah. Mine was that dad's had the blue line on the you know blue golf basically colors at the beginning, blue line and an orange line. Right. So when I started motocross, I just switched them over. Right. Right, and then. Then I had the British flag, and and it's it. You know, I was a kid too. I was like, oh, I want to see what that yeah. looks like, and it all happens. It's uh, I mean, obviously, this weekend we have. I was just thinking about it with Penske. I mean, this weekend we have um, uh, Daytona going on, yeah. the Rolex going on. Does a part of you wish you were were doing it? Now you see your old team heading in there <laughs> with arguably one of the best best prototypes out out there. Yeah. Well, um, look. I, I mean, I retired like twice. Completely re I retired <laughs> twice. Yeah. Yeah. The first time fifteen years ago. The second time ten years ago. Yeah. You know, um, and um, and you know, to this day, I still enjoy driving. Yeah. You know, um, but it's it's not what I want to do in no. my life anymore. Just and it, it just it, it's I'm focused on other things. Yeah. You know, as and and. Uh, and I know that to drive at that level, yeah. you know, with, you know, Helio, Montoya, Pagino, you know, Ray Hall and, and uh, 
uh, Taylor, uh, I forgot his first name, um, and Cameron. You know, these guys are, you know, every day. They, yeah. You know, I know Elio lived next door, you know, yeah. and he's, he, you know, he's 40, whatever, 42, I, I don't know. But, you know, the guy is Honest, unbelievable pushing, pushing, shape. Yeah. And that's pushing all, it hard. And that still is all he cares about, you know. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not at that phase in my life anymore. No. You know? And so nowadays when I drive, I just get frustrated with yeah. myself that I'm not, I don't, feel, I don't feel quite as but good you, as I was. <laughs> you know, one of the things <laughs> I, was, I thought I was anyway. Yeah, I was. So you put more light now. I huh? put more light because I yeah. think you're, we, we're handsome enough. We deserve a little more. But yeah. actually, because... Out here, this it is might, Fort Lauderdale Isles. I actually don't. Maybe yeah. take the bags away. Right. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting about people that retire from, especially a high-intensity yeah. profession, yeah. is I think there's two things you have to get used to. One is not having the opportunity to win anymore, right? It takes away a really strange part of, a, a yeah. formidable part of your life, yeah. which then people normally challenge, channel into channel Different something. Things. Bobby Rahal dealerships and you know yeah. people people do a lot um, unless you're my dad who just keeps basically driving till he's 76 but the other thing is that feeling of that feeling of getting rid of that energy that that you know yeah. it's rather like an Xbox I always thought does a way, boxer want to hit something when they're in the, in 45 way, I, I think driving is actually quite a relaxing thing mm -hmm. because it takes so much focus yeah. for you to drive that you tend to forget about everything else, yeah. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, so it's got that, that sort of feeling that... Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> you were so drive. intense as a driver. Yeah. He was very intense as a driver. He's a much nicer person now. <laughs> no, no, I mean, you were, you were saying, I joke, I joke about that, but Angela, his beautiful wife, used to say, you know, by... So this is how the weekend used to work. And I used to live across the street on another aisle when I first moved here, right, from England. And Mondays, Sheila, come back from a race, win, lose, or hurt. You know what I mean? But very <laughs> seldom, thank goodness. Uh, Mondays, for the Brazilians around here, you'd have a really good time. Yeah. We'd be barbecuing, we'd eat, we'd drink. Yeah. Monday, you'd still do a little run. Tuesday, yeah. you'd start building it back up, talking with everybody. Wednesday, you'd lose him again until Monday. Um, <laughs> it was a tough cycle, and she said it was a. It's a. It puts a lot of demands on everybody, doesn't it? Everyone around you. Well, I, I, yeah, I think everybody operates a little, a mm -hmm. little uh, differently. You know, for me, to your point, you know, I, I'm an intense guy. I'm a yeah. curious person. You know, so and it takes me time to think about every single detail of everything that mm -hmm. I needed to do on the, on the weekend, you know, yeah. reorganize my mind, reorganize my emotions. Sometimes yeah. when you had bad times, bad crashes, bad races, you know, um, and, uh, you know, you, you can't do that by just letting winging it happen. It, yeah. no. Winging it. I don't think so anyway. No. So that was my, my, uh, style. And to this day, any, any project or anything that I do, you know, um, you're pretty. I, I, you're, yeah, I, yeah, we're I, sitting <laughs> right now. We're sitting. I'm not going to show you the rest of the house, but he's sitting in basically the fruits of Gilles' labors. Is this yours? Yours said you wanted to design a house, yeah. and the minute he basically retired properly, he started building this incredible home, which every single element of it yeah. you had a you had a, yeah, a, 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 a something to, to do with. You, well, you have to think about everything. Yeah, yeah. you know, and it's a dream house. Yeah, you know? well, I, I but, like it. But it was put so. together. Do you? Do you think now that I was just I was just thinking as you're talking about intensity in, in life, you've got to have this balance. And I think your Mondays were as important in for your sure. life as no Friday. No as, question. And I worry for people that can't detune. And I wonder if for these young drivers that we're seeing how I hope that they're having this opportunity to know it's OK to away from the public eye to, to chill out and be relaxed. Because, you know, when we when we were racing and you were like, yeah, you had a. A Twitter account, but you didn't even have a Twitter account. No. There wasn't even Facebook no, 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 when no, you won your first it, championship. It didn't exist. I think Facebook, when the year you first won the championship, two thousand and one. Yeah. I think Facebook. Correct me if I'm wrong, everybody. But uh, I don't remember. I think Facebook was launched in two thousand one. 
if you think about that. <laughs> Jesus. I know. So that's, I mean, that's an awful, that's an awful change you in know, our life. And I think everyone has a, a different modus operandi, you know, uh -huh. I mean, everyone has to find their own, their own balance. And, and quite frankly, you know, I think that one of the key characteristics of a good driver is to be honest with oneself. Okay. You know? Yeah. And and if you're honest with yourself and I say, oh, well, because this guy hit me and that yeah. happened and this happened and it wasn't me, it wasn't me. That, you know, of course there are all these this third, you know, things that you don't control that influence yeah. your performance. But what about your performance? Yeah. You know? Because even if you won, you know, I'm sure you could have done something a little better here, a little better there, you know, uh, or if you didn't win because the engine blew up or yeah. something, regardless, you know, yeah. you can still review what you could have done better up until that point. Yeah. And it depends on your mindset, you know, if you're too stressed out. All these you miss a lot of these things, yeah. you know. And if you're honest with yourself, you go, "I missed that." Yeah. I, I sh see any way you can. Get I, I, I should have noticed that. Mm -hmm. You know, why was I always breaking that way into that corner? That's stupid. Yeah. You know, um, and you have to find your own balance. You know, on and to get the right state of mind to be fully aware of what's going on with you and with the car, with the team and with your competitors. Does that make any sense? I sound like a guru. Maybe you you are a guru. Sense. Maybe yeah. it's okay. Hey, listen, so it does make sense. Mustafa yeah. Ali says, as technology progresses, aero and electric, is the learning curve to get, it, get back into a modern car steeper? Does the technology take away from the emotional engagement in driving? I guess that's two questions. What they're saying, but you see it in Formula One, don't you? Massa was kept around because he knew so much about the technology that it, yeah. and he's fast, but yeah. but his value probably in a bit a high degree was his technology. The further away you are from the sport, if you retired for three years, yeah, do you think you could go back? Not you now, but in Formula One or IndyCar? Actually, I think I could. Okay. You know, if I was fit and in the right mindset mm -hmm. and everything, I, I think I could because... Talking about fitness or having a drink. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because, um, I mean, I, I sort of kept pace with yeah. what's going on, you know. Uh, I, I do some consulting in, in motorsports and I like technology. I'm, I'm a, so you're not I'm a, a walk-away guy. I'm a wannabe yeah. engineer yeah. anyway. I mean, there are some skills that, to your point, you know, earlier in that conversation, we had to have that is no longer required, such yeah. as downshifting and, and things like that. Um, but, you know, even when I jumped from an IndyCar stop, literally have not driven a road course for since 2001. I'd all retired in 2003. Hadn't driven a road course since 2001 when I went to drive the, the, prototype. the prototype. Straight back. And, you know, I've never driven with with paddle shifts wow. and I, I didn't have um, I never driven with uh, traction control what else never had carbon brakes oh. it was no problem you know you see my driving that feeling for the limit you know and and the, you know I know the cars have electronics and all this kind of thing but the feel for the limit the feel for the tires the feel for the brakes and how much combine you have you can do and so on it's it's driving. It's the drive. that, <laughs> it's driving. That generation of drivers, it's funny because I think a lot of people would presume that being an engineer, you couldn't have that flexibility. But in the old days, and, and even now, dad's point is, I remember when I was going to go to touring cars yeah. and I'd only done the open wheel stuff. He goes, and I'm like, everyone tells me, he goes, it's just a car. It's, it's a just car. a car. <laughs> if you can drive, you can drive it. Yeah. And anyone that can't really is probably not the driver they thought they were exactly right and you know cars behave differently yeah you know but it's it's, it's, a, it's a car <laughs> i actually know bob i know the answer to this what was the question bob then? says does jill have any interest in taking part in vintage <laughs> racing <laughs> do you want Q to, do you want to <laughs> answer yes, for no you can uh, he can answer Go on. you know what i love those vintage cars but no <laughs> No, no. I have no interest. Uh, you know, actually, I had a conversation with your dad that made me submit the view as well. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, uh, frankly, um, those cars are dangerous. You yeah. Know, they were dangerous then. Yeah. They're dangerous now. Um, 
some even more dangerous because then they were well looked after yeah. by a professional well, team day in and day out. Nowadays, you know, sometimes collect, uh, collector cars are, are not as as carefully maintained yeah. as as a car that belongs mm -hmm. to a full time Formula One team with 100 employees yeah. and and so on and so forth. But you know, do I enjoy driving them? Sometimes I no do. offense taken, Bob. <laughs> Sometimes I like it. I like driving, you know, but I, I, and I, I drink because you start to get enthusiastic and you sort of go, oh, oh no, 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 no. Well, the trouble is what yeah. happens, just to be honest with you guys, is I, I did a couple of the historic races. I've done Goodwood Festival Speed and things. Yeah. And the guy, I got asked to do it one time in like the Z-Type. And then the guy calls me and says, I've just spent a hundred grand on the engine. You know, I really hope you can win. And I thought, well, I'm really only going so I um, can get a ticket to the ball on the Saturday night and, <laughs> and cruise around. People take it very seriously. I, and the other, I always remember looking at the Tyrrell six wheeler. Yeah. Those little baby it's wheels, an amazing, car. amazing car. And I thought to myself, as I watched the octologist, you know, proctologist who owned it drive off up yeah. the hill, I think, I think Jackie Stewart tr trouble driving that. Yeah. I don't think he found it easy, you know, and, and, <laughs> I'm thinking it hasn't got easier. I promise no. you, it hasn't got easier. I have to say though, I tell you, since this is a good time to uh, tell stories about old cars and stuff. Uh, recently, I was in uh, Switzerland with some friends, and they have a couple of old, old cars, um, yeah. uh, road cars, you know. And as you also know, I don't enjoy driving on the street very much. Um, Unless it was in a little Honda S2000 <laughs> that he got lent by Honda and he took me to the gym one day and we were not in a straight line between here. That car deserved yeah, the view, so, but it was just like rev to like 9,000 revs yeah, and we were great car. So, But anyway, and you know, so this buddy of mine says, oh, let's go driving. And it, it was an old uh, Ferrari from the 60s, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it was a reminder of how I fell in love with driving okay. because you know it had a beautiful V12 and yeah. you and you know I'm not no not like you're just this. enjoying the yeah thing. I'm enjoying the shifting I'm enjoying the turning feeling a little bit of a slide yeah. being really careful with the throttle mm -hmm. otherwise the engine you know you, you, you have to drive it and no, I think uh, we uh, fell in love with the analog experience and yeah. that reminded yeah. me of the analog. it reminded me of that and I'm like you know what that was a lot of fun <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, um, uh, oh, I'll answer this one, John. Uh, favorite race car? I mean, favorite race car. The ones you won in? Yeah. Well, I, I it's hard for me to pick one. Okay. I was fortunate enough to drive some really, really cool cars. Um, the two thousand and one Penske Reynard Honda was a beautiful car. You know, yeah. it was kind of the second year of development of. Uh, that Penske had with the Reynard, uh and the second year with with Penske and Honda. The second year that we had with the Firestone tires, and we understood it. It's just you know they so, did a beautiful job, and then the aerodynamics were great. The car was amazing, yeah. fun, but you know the Acura uh, P1 and P2 car were was really fun. To, really fun to drive really. what do, what's your favorite i just was thinking because the other day someone posted a picture up of uh, no i was watching the williams documentary and yeah. they were saying frank's favorite car yeah. or whatever time um you should watch it if you haven't seen it um what was your favorite just side note favorite formula one era for the look of the cars uh probably late 80s yeah uh, when they got know, very early 90s yeah yeah um, but you know, I actually really like, for example, one of my favorite Formula One cars ever, maybe because I'm Brazilian, was Nelson's uh, championship winning car in '81. Okay, you yeah. know, that was beautiful. Yeah. Thing, you know, with a Parmalat. Parmalat. So it's probably, I was about know, to say, what's your favorite probably. paint scheme? But it's yeah, probably, one, probably. Okay. <laughs> I know, everyone has their favorite, favorite yeah. paint scheme. Just going back, because I, I, we actually did have this conversation one time around there on his deck, actually at his other house, um, old house. And I don't really remember the answering. I remember getting very emotional asking it to you because we may have had a couple of these. That 241 mile an hour close sport. No, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, close sport. I'm, I'm not getting into that one. Uh, the close sport record, the track record that you still hold. Yeah. I remember asking you because I was okay. I did my thing in driving, but you had an ability in qualifying to take a car to a limit. I, and I remember asking you how, how, 
did you do that? Because it's it, uh, you're a smart guy. I think I have too much imagination. That's why I couldn't do it. <laughs> Maybe you have no imagination. But w w what? how was that feeling? And I remember him telling me in the middle of it, and the car started to move a little in the middle of the corner. I just kept my foot flat. And I'm going, how? Is it a question when the car's right? You can do it? Or were you able to put yourself into a center-like state? Well, I, I, I can answer that in, in, in different ways, right? So let's answer it from the qualifying perspective. Mm -hmm. I always love qualifying. You know, because uh, qualifying, it's it's the only time on the weekend, on a race weekend, that there's no other consideration other than being fast. Yeah. You know, yeah. you don't have to worry about the about yeah. you don't have to worry about the engines. You don't have to worry about the tires. You don't have to worry about the brakes. You don't have to worry about fuel consumption. You don't have to worry about who's in front of you, who's behind you, what they're thinking, and so it's you against you and one objective is with one objective yeah. so i love qualifying because it was very pure you know and over the years i discovered i guess you know we're talking about you mm -hmm. know uh, learning right that to qualify well you really need to be in a very sort of primitive state of mind <laughs> you wow. know um stripped of everything else there. Stripped of no every, sponsors it, no nothing well yeah. just you know um i found that useful you know i was always you know quite um aggressive uh, in a sense you know it, it was hard to verbalize uh, yeah. things that you know i remember stopping so it's like how's God? I don't care, just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, um, and, uh, and, and when you are able to attain that state of mind, you're all feeling, you can feel everything, you know, and, and you, you know, I don't know, I don't talk about, I saw the car and all this yeah. kind of thing, and maybe he did, um, but for me, it was a, a, a difference, it's just like, this hyper awareness of yeah. of uh, of what's going on and and this incredible feeling of i'm going to do this regardless yeah. <laughs> you know um and um and it's a beautiful feeling when you find that that state of mind which is hard you don't yeah. always find it and yeah. sometimes you do and uh when it's right it's right and yeah. when it's right it's right and it's a great feeling i'm moving that out did you because yeah, i think okay. it's blinding my camera okay. do you do you think um, oh that's better look we'll yeah do, do you prefer if you had set do you think i've never asked anyone this never thought about what call a, getting on pole being the fastest man on the earth in those cars yeah. on that day is equal or greater to winning you know, at the time, winning has a lot of factors. Yeah, exactly. I, I always took a lot of pride in my qualifying records. You know, <laughs> as, as I said earlier, and and when when that whole thing happened, you know, frankly, the record didn't mean much of anything. All I cared about is putting the car on pole and gaining the extra point that at the time was available. Uh, it was going to help me, uh, hopefully, win the championship the next, my first championship the next day. As the years gone by, you yeah. know, um, I don't know. I attach some meaning to that. Yeah, you know? a, that is quite an amazing thing. I never. Yeah. That kind of leads us on to something else, which I, I, I don't think there's a place when a driver's currently racing to ask these questions. Yeah. But I actually I thought about it because this morning I did an interview for a Vauxhall Lotus book. Yeah. The guy has he reached out to you? He's going to. He has actually. Out. Yeah, and I talked to him this morning. Yeah, yeah. You should uh, Vauxhall Lotus. He's doing a book, right? Yeah, his book. Yeah. And he's not from racing. He had to he's find not. everyone on Facebook and he just decided to do it. And he's loving it. Anyway, Volsa Lotus, Opal yeah, Lotus no, in Europe, Volsa Lotus, exactly. actually, when I say launched the careers, it didn't launch, but it was a formative part of a so many careers. I mean, he listed them all. Um, a lot of people. <laughs> a lot of people. Anyway, it'll be a great book. Look into it. We both drove in it. Everything, everybody uh, has uh, it sort of came from that just for Formula 3 back in the late 80s, early 90s. But I brought up a story because he was talking about Camel. And I said, well, we were all sponsored by Camel. And it was uh, Brabham's, it was both Gary and me and, yeah. and um, Paul Stewart and yeah. our friend and Paul Warwick. 
And I said, you know, I, it was the best of the worst of the years because I learned so much. Uh, and I was with these cool guys, but I went up to Paul on the grid because I was so excited. I was wearing my yellow camel ovals and I shook his hands and I was like this. And then I watched him die, you know, come to, yeah. and those lessons that we go through, it, it, it's, it's the cruelest of sports and our sport has got safer in every single way. But I had this conversation, I've had it with Sterling Moss in the day, I've had it with many of the drivers. It's what keeps our sport, sadly, very real. The yeah. day that it, otherwise it'll just be a simulator sport. Yeah. How, what was risk like for you? What was, you've lost a lot of, you know, not a lot, yeah. thank God, but no. some significant friends. No, I, um, I, what does I, it mean I, to I, you? Unfortunately, I witnessed witness some tragedies which people I care a lot about and uh, and I still to this day yeah. I think about it yeah. um, look people deal with risk in different ways right um, I had colleagues that it's never gonna happen to me you know um, but you know that's it's valid for for valid. for him, yeah. and and that's yeah. okay. You know the way I approached it is, because um, actually in a funny way, ever since I was go karting, you know, uh, I saw some serious accidents yeah. in karting. You yeah. know, yeah, and people getting seriously hurt in karting. Um, so I thought, okay, well, it's definitely there yeah. you know yeah. I mean uh, you got to be blind you know yeah. or fooling yourself if you don't understand the seriousness of the risk that you're incurring every time you sit in the go-kart in the car you know people go, ah, but that's not so dangerous listen you go in any racing any car, car any car you know back to the historics any car any car you you put yourself at risk you better understand those risks and you, you better try to mitigate those risks the best you can you know um, so that was my approach I understood it and I always ask myself am I prepared to take those risks or are they holding me back you know mm. every time you know because I knew every time I strapped myself particularly in an IndyCar, which is yeah. very obvious, the, yeah. the risk that you're, the, the, that you're taking. Uh, you're like, are you holding back or are you in that moment? Are you driving to the limit, you know? Um, and I never had a, I never had an issue, you know? Um, I had an issue once with, you know, I, I had the accident in uh, Phoenix where I broke my back and my neck in the beginning of 2003. And then I came back for the opening day of the Indy, five, uh, the, the Indy 500 in that year. And, um, you know, the first two days in the car, the first day, day and a half, actually wasn't by the end of the second day, I was fine. But just, you know, when you're late, you, you yes. know, it, it's just not happening. You know, I, I, I was like, turn too much turn too little oh my god oh jesus yeah everything was and and you're going yeah you're going fast and you know it's not flowing and you're like oh my, you know yeah. and then i was very aware of jesus you know yeah. um what it's it wasn't clicking yeah. you know um and then slowly everything sort of calmed down yeah and I was fine. Yeah. <laughs> and and you know I, I won the race. You won. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but anyway, uh, so I guess that's how I saw uh, how I dealt with race. I always ask my I always ask myself, do I have the courage, or do I not? I think it's a good way of looking at it. I mean, for again for these young kids that now you I say to them when I try to fake it, Justin, because there's yeah. too many good guys. Too many good guys. Out. So you yeah. can't hold it back a yeah. little bit. It just yeah. keep that little bit in the pocket. No, I mean, I'll, too I, many good I, I, I thought I was going to say you this know? one day when I'm, when I was much older, but I, you know, I mean, my dad knows I came to Indy the first year of the, of, in the, of the IRL yeah. and I managed to find a car and I found a car and I had my little bit of sponsors. I'd never driven one. But they would throw. They were trying to get anyone in the series, right? right. But not um, not from outside America <laughs> to begin with. Anyway, I did it. I I got in this car. And like, I was what excited. Am I, doing? <laughs> I basically by the end of this team 
disastrous. I remember in the end, Johnny Rutherford, who was my guy, Johnny came to me and he looked at me and he said, you know, Justin, I think you're a great driver and probably are in what you do, but I don't know if you crash this car, you may not leave the speedway yeah. on your own. And I'm going, and I knew in the morning, I would, I would pack my wash bag in the morning because I was worried someone else was coming to get it. Really? You know, you can't live like that. No. You cannot race. So, and do you know what? That, that experience there, because the car literally, it would, oil was going on the rear tires, the, that digital board on the back straight would say number 15, number 15. I'd come in. It was raining. It was, uh, it actually affected, <laughs> it affected. Do you know what? I was terrified. My dad came out to see me because he was so scared for me. Yeah. And I realized I could never, ever go back because it yeah. actually had broken my, my will. You yeah. know what I mean? And, uh, and that's why I think it's, um, it's hard to do it like that just yeah go, no no you know it's, it's uh so so i mean um well let's try and move on a little bit from from racing our sport is changed but this year i mean you had your taste of sports cars you came in yeah. there i'm bringing it up because this weekend is the rolex nearly everyone watching uh is knows it is it's outrageous for our sport that we have fernando alonso coming along yeah. Um, but last year, <laughs> yeah. uh, you were basically his, I mean, as you said, how do I mentor one of the best drivers of our, of our era, <laughs> yeah, exactly. but it, you did, right? You were more useful to him than you thought at the Indy 500 last no, year. He enjoyed it. No, I think you, he enjoyed it. You enjoyed it. Yeah. There was a bond based in professional respect. Yeah. I think that became friendship. Um, can I say what you said about you thought it was his talent behind the wheel? I mean, it was apparent to you. You know what it takes to do indie. Yeah. Um, what was it like for you working with someone else who you could admire his raw talent that you'd never raced against? No, exactly. Which is kind of interesting. Listen, talk about intense. Oh, <laughs> really? Know, uh, very intense, very intelligent man, very determined, you know, very serious, very serious. Is he? Very serious, very focused. Um, and, and you know, and we spoke about this before, but you know, to be a, a, a great racing driver, you know, you have to score very high in a whole bunch of different factors. Yeah, right? you have to be great car control, good feel, you know, fast hands, whatever people talk about, emotional control, uh, intelligence, learning how to deal with the team. I mean, there's like a thousand different categories yeah. and very rarely um, people score very high on all of them, yeah. you know, and, uh, like this kid's going to but I'm very fast. I said, oh, good. You like, you click mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. of a million yeah. <laughs> factors and, uh, you know, I'm working with Fernando. It's clear that, you know, he hits them all. He, he, he scores very highly on, yeah. on, all of the things you can possibly think of that would make a good racing driver good. I mean, and it'll be great seeing him this weekend. Yeah. I don't know if he could have done Daytona without having done Indy. To, to, I don't to, know. To, 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 I'm talking you about know, getting I mean, used I to think, American I, fans. I, yeah, but I think you do great there, man, because I, I, one thing I learned about him is that he's a racer. He, okay, just racing. he loves racing. You know, he, he, it's, he just loves racing. He's he going to come this weekend. He loves the whole wheel-to-wheel -wheel thing, yeah. and, and he gets a kick out of it. Yeah. And, and as you know, in sports car racing, that's... Multi-class racing at, at Daytona. It's, yeah, no, I think he's uh, going to do it. David, I'm going to pull this picture up, because I think this is uh, quite interesting. Jill will love this. G I met Jill at the Long picture. Beach Grand Prix a few years ago. Afterwards, I felt kind of bad because I came up, shook his hand, and then turned my attention to Simon Pagano. <laughs> Simon had just won the previous race, and I was somewhat starstruck by his talent. Anyway, Gilles was nice. No, no, he didn't. He says, Gilles was a gentleman and such an incredible talent. Uh, let's just talk quickly. David, he'll forgive you. Um, Forgiven. <laughs> what? Simon, another guy. You have now mentored, I mean, Elio and Simon, and worked with these great talents. It must have been great for you seeing Simon, go on to win the championship. And you said straight away when we didn't even know how to spell his last name. Yeah. You, you said this kid's good. Yeah, no, he's, I, listen, I, it was, you know, I hired Simon for, for the sports cars yeah. uh, for, at the time, was the American Le Mans years, uh, when he was 26, 25, yeah. no, 24. Actually. Yeah. I don't remember. Um, and what struck me about him was his attitude and his intelligence. You know, obviously he was talented talented because you know you don't win Atlantic championships and yeah. and drive an IndyCar very competently 
without being talented, but I liked his attitude. I liked his mindset. Uh, I thought he was a very intelligent man. And uh, so in my mind, he had the tools to evolve, yeah. you know, yeah. and develop himself. And, and quite frankly, even when I started the team back in 08, great timing, yeah. um, <laughs> um, I... Uh, I, I wasn't really just an. I, I I know I went back in the cockpit, but I wasn't looking for a career as a racing driver anymore. I was looking for someone to put almost put the pressure on. No, no, the, no. The, not only that, but that I could mentor into a position that would allow me to withdraw from the from okay. driving. Um, and I saw the potential with that in Simon and uh, oh, it was well deserved because now well, look at, you know. and you know when unfortunately after the crisis uh, in in 09 we had to cancel the uh, uh, we had to cancel the program but um, you know I was, I was you know he's a good friend and you know I, even then uh, I, I called Roger then you know did you uh, and I said look you, you need to look at this guy um, and uh, and then actually when he ended up with Honda, uh, with uh, Penske, I was actually, you know, at the time I was uh, consulting uh, for Honda and I was trying to keep him in the <laughs> Honda camp. <laughs> but, know, because, but quite yeah. happy he got the opportunity. Well, it was, I was torn, yeah. you know, because yeah. obviously I, I was, you know, working with Honda who I have a great deal of respect and uh, have a, a very long relationship. Yeah. And, you know, when Roger got him, uh, I was happy for Simon. It was, yeah, it was, it was, I was I was conflicted, but of course, uh, you know, I was happy for Simon and it was great that he won a, yeah. a championship and uh, and you probably won more. That's cool. Um, I keep thinking of many many things I could talk to Jill about. We're going to have to do this again because there's a lot. We I mean we need to talk about Roger. We need to talk about people like this. I mean, there's so many things. Yeah. But Jill called me a week ago. And because of all the new car stuff I do, and believe it or not, he drove little Hondas pretty much for most of yeah. your life. He never had fancy cars outside. Now you have a couple of nice ones. But what do you think about? I think in racing terms, we're in another heyday, yeah. right? I think Indy cars looking great. Yeah. Um, TV's great. IMS has exploded. I think it's the number one series for me, yeah. certainly in the world outside Formula One. And but the road, modern road cars, yeah. Do, do you still get that buzz when you go, ooh, a 720S McLaren, I'd like to drive that, or an M4 BMW? Or what, do you, what do road cars do for you? Because I've never really heard I, you talk about them. Yeah, well, I, I'm kind of conflicted, actually, here, because I, I love sports cars, some of the supercars. I, I, I particularly like, the, to your point, the 720 yeah, McLaren. Yeah. Do you know, <laughs> you I know? drove it the other day, best yeah. car. Yeah, I mean, I, I did a track day the other day, and I what was it, a 650, I thought. 650, yes. Yeah, anyway, I, I'm like, wow, this thing is yeah. awesome. Um, but I also look at it and think, yeah, I'd love to take it around on the track, mm -hmm. you know. But for the street, I'm more into comfort, yeah. <laughs> actually. Yeah. Uh, space, you know, and uh, a nice... You know, ventilated seats <laughs> and uh, and uh, and a stereo and, and and complete isolation. I mean, a few years ago, a friend of mine had a had a Rolls Royce actually, yeah. and we went for a for a drive. That was back in the UK. Went for a drive and had the stereo on, shut the windows, and it, we weren't going fast in your own world. Yeah, it's you literally like floating, and it's yeah. comfortable, <laughs> and we were talking, and 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 I don't, it, you know. Especially nowadays, I mean, you can't, you, you really can't drive, have do any kind of performance driving on the street anymore. Um, sometimes you can, but not not really. Um, so I'm I'm kind of torn because I, I to your point, I, I looked at that, that when that car was launched, the 720 McLaren. I'm like, whoa, yeah, I like that. <laughs> um, and. Uh, but I, but I want to take that out on, on the You track. have to take them on the track. I think yeah. that's why. No point unless you're driving on autobahn. I think you could be right. Yeah. Well, listen, I, um, I also, we need to talk about Formula E. We need to talk about this. We yeah. need to talk about, there's so many things. But we'll, we, we actually. Are we out of time? We're, we're not really we, out of time. You haven't even finished. I, I know I haven't. I haven't. Yeah. I'm Jill, yeah. I know a lot about you. 
but people don't know a lot about you in a lot of ways away from this. I think they're given a bit more of an insight. If you were able to write your early obituary, what do you think, what would you like people to say about you when they get, when it's all said and done, what do they, how do you want to be remembered? Hopefully not for another 30 years, but 40 years. Well, how do you, how, what would you like them to say? I don't think I care about being remembered, to be honest. <laughs> it's such a, it's such a <laughs> honestly. I don't. Huh? No, I, listen, I, I live here and now. We're having a good time now. Mm -hmm. and, and You live um, for now a bit more now. The what? You live for the moment maybe a bit more now. Yeah. And, um, I'm actually going to get you, I'm going to get you um, embalmed. What do they do? They do with animals. You know when they stuff them, and I think I'm just going to have you by the barbecue with a pair of tongs <laughs> and a caipirinha in another hand. Yeah, and but listen, but just in a, you know, uh, joking aside, you know, uh, um, I, I want to be remembered as a, as a good friend, you know, as as uh, you know, a, a good influence on 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 the people that I've touched, you know, that that our paths crossed not the other way around. That's it. I think we should stop there, don't you? <laughs> Thank you very much. Just so you know, wherever you are in the world, this evening will carry on going. Thanks for watching, guys. Uh, You're going to miss a good evening yeah. here, guys, by the way. Do not let us go back on Facebook tonight. <laughs> That's not a good idea. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Bye.